Hello everyone, great to see all of you this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Vera, I'll be your moderator for the webinar today. Um, so uh, this is the sixth Conservation Champions webinar that we're hosting. And if you're new here, uh, welcome. The Conservations Conservation Champions webinar uh, was curated really to help you discover more about uh, wildlife conservation through the eyes and hands of our staff as well as our conservation partners. So a very warm welcome to everyone who's joined us today. So today we're going to be talking about um, a bird species that is very, very special to us here at Mandai. And um, that is the straw-headed bubu, as you can see on the screen in front of you. Uh, the straw-headed bubu is a songbird. Who's native to, that's native to Singapore, as well as um, some other parts of Southeast Asia. And um, today I have two colleagues here today who are very, very passionate about straw-headed bubbles and they are here to tell you a bit more about uh, the bird itself as well as uh, some of the conservation efforts that um, Mandai has been putting in. We've got Dr. Jess from Mandai Nature. Uh, she's the head of the Avian Species Programs and Partnerships um, in Mana Nature, and she oversees uh, conservation projects which affect straw-headed bubu populations in the region. And we've got Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Uh, Rachel is a keeper at our breeding and research centre in the newly opened bird paradise. Um, she works directly with straw-headed bubbles uh, in our collection, and she also coordinates breeding efforts uh, for straw-headed bubbles in our parks. So thank you so much for uh, spending the evening with us. Um, so there may be some in our audience who may not have heard about straw-headed bubbles before, right? Um, not everybody is a birder. Um, not everybody, you know, goes for regular walks in the forest. Um, and when I talked to my daughter this morning about uh, straw-headed bubbles, uh, then she suddenly giggled. Ha ha ha, what's a bubu? How come it's called a bubu? So maybe Jess, uh, can you tell us why is a bubu called a bubu? And what is a bubu anyway? Most certainly. In fact, I got a little model here to help me, this bird here is a straw de bobo. Now very quickly, uh, bobo is a type of passerine. If you know what a passerine is, a passerine essentially is a perching bird. So it's got special legs that allows it to perch on trees and branches, essentially. And it's often described as a medium-sized passerine bird. So bobos are found right across um, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. Most of the most, most bulls fly. They eat things like nectar, you know, seeds, but they're really known for eating fruits. So we call these birds frugivorous, food eating. And every now and then they'll supplement their diet with protein, which comes in the form of insects. And something unique about bobo is where the word bobo comes from. It's a very strange word, you know. It's supposed to say bird, you say bobo, right? So Rachel and I were talking earlier. And we think, um, well, upon reading and doing some research, we feel that uh, we found that the word bobo comes from what we think is an Ar Arabic word for a nightingale, which makes sense because um, Vera early on said that uh, the bobo is also called a songbird. And it's a no brainer to, you know, the songbird actually means a bird that sings, and a bobo sings really, really well. In fact, if, uh, if, I go, if you pull up the slides, you will notice all these birds here. Some of them, some of these birds may be familiar to you. The one at the extreme left is a straw de bobo. And you can tell already that all these bobos come in different shapes, different sizes. But something that's common to all of these uh, three birds and other bobos is that they all sing really well. Thanks, Jess. Um, so, you know, Rachel, you work with these birds daily. You care for them. Um, maybe you could share with our audience you know, something interesting that only you might know as a keeper um, that other people might not know but also might, you know, might want to know. Okay, sure. Let me share a bit more about the straw-headed bubbles. So why are they called the straw-headed bubbles? As their name suggests, it's because their head um, is actually straw-coloured. They're also known as the straw-crowned bubbles. So one interesting thing about them, I guess, is that they actually sing a duet. Mm. So if you pay close attention, some, the song is actually sang, usually sung by a pair. But if you do hear some, they are missing some notes, maybe that's just a soloist. <laughs> yeah, so now we'll show you a duet sing by a pair of straw-headed bubbles. Ooh, what a beautiful song, right? Um, I, I, but ironically, this, this, very, very, this very song is what um, has been causing the decline in population for straw-headed bubbles um, in Southeast Asia. 
Right. Um, maybe Jess, can you tell us a bit more about why that uh, is and what, what, why, how, ha- how does the song link to, you know, a decline in their population? Mo- most certainly. In fact, we often call it sadly the song of extinction. Um, mm. But um, if, you, if we pull up the slides, please. Uh, so very quickly, um, with regards to Strata Bobo, um, it's very, as you mentioned earlier on, this bird is found right across Southeast Asia um, and also in Singapore. And the, the, the biggest threat really is what we call the illegal and unsustainable um, songbird trade. Um, second to that is habitat loss because habitat loss obviously removes, you know, the natural spaces this bird will occur normally. Um, if we go on to the next slide, um, so, so, so very quickly, um, touching on this whole idea of the trade, uh, this this ho- this practice of songbird keeping, which is what drives the demand for birds like Strata Bobo, is is sort of entrenched in Southeast Asian culture. So a lot of people practice the keeping of songbirds, right, in their houses. Mm. There's also extensions of that. People will take these birds to competition where different songbirds compete, and the winning bird gets the prestige, the glory, the honor, and and some prize money. Um, and, you know, in other parts of Southeast Asia, songbirds are also kept and used in religious releases, right? So where, you know, by releasing trapped songbirds, you get good luck because you're setting them free. And But already you can tell, you know, songbird keeping is, is linked to all kinds of religious and cultural practice um, in Southeast Asia. And because of that, you know, the demand for songbirds increases. And this Strada Bobo is just one of those sad stories, right? Um, central to the songbird uh, uh, trade. And if casting your eyes on the map here in this image, you notice the bits in grey. So the grey bits is what where the Strata Bobo originally occurs. And you can tell it's found right across Southeast Asia, um, Peninsula Malaysia, Sumatra, parts of Java and Borneo. Bits in red is where we think they're remaining, um, but we don't have evidence to show because the, the last sighting of the birds in that red shade is you know, as, as far back as 2000. The red circle shows you where we, we know birds have gone extinct. So red shade is where we think they're left, but red circle shows that recent surveys, we couldn't find any of these birds. Um, and the bits in blue, which are uh, just a, a collective number of sightings and, and places where we've seen the birds uh, across Borneo, Peninsula, Malaysia, and Singapore, is where we know the bird remains because uh, recent studies have been done and with confirmed sightings. And you can really tell from, from, from that, uh, you know, this bird's actually gone from most of its range. And its current uh, global population stands at anywhere from 600 to 1,700 birds. So it's, it's drastically declined. Um, in fact, after an Uplisting to endanger in 2016, you know, the, the severe decline prompted another uplisting to Kulikia endangered, and now this bird is one step away from extinction. Now, if we look at the Singapore population, the Singapore population stands from anywhere from 200 to 500 birds, um, and that also includes offshore island Pulau Ubin. So, Singapore has possibly has, you know, either the global population, the whole population found here in our island, you know, small island state, or one third of the global population. Um, and, that's, and that's why we believe Singapore is a stronghold for this species, and that's why this species is special to us as Singaporeans. Um, now, if we look at the Mandai Parks, the Mandai Parks also have wild strata bobos, and the, the group of birds found here is anywhere to up to 5% of the world's population, so it's not a, it's not a small figure, mm. the birds here at Mandai. Yeah. I think we, are, uh, we count ourselves lucky, right, yeah. to be able to see straw-headed bobos, really, where we work in the wild. Um, <coughs> so, but... Why, why do you think Singapore is such a stronghold? And what, is it because poaching is not such a big threat here? Yep. So, you know, Singapore, we're, we're very fortunate to have high levels of education, um, high levels of awareness. So um, people know, right, that this bird is threatened and poaching rates are generally low. Um, there's also really strong laws, local laws and international laws that protect the species uh, from the trade, but also enforcement um, by our agencies and people, right, the common man that cares about the bird. So if they see something dodgy happening to a uh, wild strata bobo, they often report it. And because of that, our population, you know, remains strong. And the ongoing greening efforts, um, you know, here, not just here in Mandai, but across wider Singapore, is also what's contributing to, you know, keeping the habitat for the strata bobo intact. Hmm. I mean, that's, that's really a nice piece of news. Uh, it's really nice to hear when in, you know, the climate of climate change and, you know, environmental um, uh, mishappenings. Um, so, 
while um, Singapore's populations are really healthy, um, it's not so much the case in the region. Uh, what is Mandai doing about it? Great question. And this is going to be a long answer, so bear with me. Um, we're doing all kinds of things to try to preserve this very special bird to us. Um, you see in this nested circle here in the slides, right, we've got, uh, we protect the Strata Bobo in many layers, many ways, and these are all connected. At the very core, we do have Strata Bobos under our care, and Rachel is probably the best person to talk about this. So what I'm going to talk about is what we do with the Bobos that exist here within the Mandai area, but also across Singapore, Southeast Asia, and beyond. I said earlier that we do have up to 5% of the world's population of bobos found in Mandai. So part of what we do to protect bobos in a Mandai precinct is to actually study them, is to know what numbers we're talking about. So we have these figures only because we carried out a study over the last year or so to better understand the population of bobos here in our precinct, to know what part of the population is breeding, to know what trees they're using for food, but also as nests here. Once we have all this information, we're more able to protect the bobo within, a, within our precinct, but also create new spaces, right, and restore their habitats. And this is just a list of, um, you know, the, the bits in white shows you what's already in the literature, right, of what the bobo is using. The bits in gray is what we found here at Mandai, the birds are also using in, in the wild. And the species that they use, the plant species they use comprise of plants that are not only just native to Singapore, but also non-native to Singapore. So going back to the nested circles, this is our work in Mandai. The next layer up is our work in Singapore. So Mandai, uh, Nature and Mandai Wildlife Group together are members of a national force. We call it the Stewardhead of Bobo Working Group. It's a national group led by the National Parks Board and Nature Society Singapore. And this group was formed um, back in 2019 with the core aim of protecting the bobo within Singapore. So it's, for example, how do we connect habitat patches together so the bobo can move around our island states more, more effectively? Or how do we better protect habitat um, in Singapore for, for the species? The next layer up, beyond Singapore, Southeast Asia, because this bobo is found across you know, the ASEAN region. And what we do here is um, Mandai Nature is actually hosting the IUC and SSC Asian Summit Trade Specialist Group um, that's involved in implementing a strategy. And if you look at the, that document on the left, right, the green um, image on the left of the picture, that's that Southeast Asian regional strategy for songbirds, of which the bobo is a very key focal species on. And that involves, you know, better understanding bobo populations across its range, not, not just in Singapore, so we can better protect them, but also working with um, people that keep songbirds to see how we can get them to, you know, appreciate songbirds in the wild rather than in a cage, and, and how, how we can spread, you know, and raise awareness for this bird across Southeast Asia. And the final layer is global. And by global, if you look at that the acronym at the top, CITES, it's a, it's a long word. Essentially what CITES is, is an international government legislation that uh, regulates the international commercial trade of animals. Now the bobo, the bobo was originally on, a, on an appendix two. An appendix two listing essentially means you could trade the bird uh, commercially, but with some sort of quota or it's a regulated trade. But what that means is international trade can still happen. And this bird is already, you know, I said earlier, one step away from extinction. So what, what we felt really important as a conservation community was to actually uplist this bird from a CITES 2 to a CITES 1 uplist, uh, uh, uplisting. And a CITES 1 appendix listing essentially means no commercial international trade of the Strata Bobo. And that, you know, together with our National Parks Board and other conservation and government partners, last year in Panama at a CITES meeting, uh, we saw the successful uplisting of the Strata Bobo to CITES 1, meaning moving forward, there should not be any more international uh, commercial trade of this bird. And hopefully this, this new legislation will help protect the bobo better in the wild. So, so just, um, just a quick question. If, you, if we see a uh, straw-headed bobo being sold in Singapore, does that mean it's illegal or... What, should, should if you do something? see a straw-headed bobo being sold in Singapore and, or someone who keeps it as a pet and you're concerned about it, my suggestion is to reach out to the National Parks Board as the, the local authorities involved in protecting the bobo in Singapore and, and get their support in that matter. Mm. Yep. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, thank, thanks so much for sharing you know, the big overview um, and the, the, the broad efforts right, um, for straw-headed bobos in the region. Uh, but maybe we can bring it back down to our parks. Um, we mentioned 
<clears throat> in our parks, um, there was in the in in the circles that Jess had talked through. There was that central grey circle there, uh, which says XC two, and XC two really just means that um, that uh, just refers to conservation uh, efforts that are outside of the um, species natural habitats, and where that is, in our case, is in bird paradise, right? Um, and that's where Rachel really comes in. <clears throat> so Rachel, besides being a keeper, uh, you also hold um, another role. Uh, and that's um, the role of a breeding coordinator. Uh, so you um, uh, oversee, I suppose, all the uh, breeding efforts for uh, straw-headed bubbles within that program, within the breeding program. Maybe could you let us know a bit more about what you do? Um, what, what does it mean to be a coordinator? Uh, and what are the kinds of tasks that you have to um, do so that you can do that job well? Okay, um, I think to sum up the role of a coordinator is like being the bird's matchmaker, mm. but not so much based on looks, but on genetics. <laughs> so we use software to run, um, like we do genetics research on them and then we run on the software to see which individual will match um, another one because mm. the population under human care is limited. So mm. we need to minimize, or we need to maximize the genetic diversity and make sure that the pool doesn't, have too much inbreeding. So we need to make sure that the genes are still healthy enough right. to be an insurance population. So as a coordinator, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. We run all this and then we make recommendations for breeding. Mm. And then we also arrange to... Set, uh, we make recommendations so that zoos can send the individuals to each other for pairing. But in our case, Manda is the only zoological institute that owns straw-headed bobo. So it's a relatively simple job for me as a species <laughs> coordinator for the straw-headed bobo. Okay, so how how in your uh in your words what how does your work um as a breeding coordinator how does it help um the broader conservation efforts? Uh, so as mentioned, we keep uh, straw-headed bubbles under human care in yeah. our in our parks. So uh, it's also an insurance population in mm. case like there's a disease outbreak in Mandai or like in Singapore that caused the decline in population in a while. Yeah, but we have in our care will be able to help with the population also. Eventually, one day, hopefully with our breeding and more successes, we can help to introduce the offsprings back into the wild. Right. Yeah. So what does a typical day for you look like? Okay, so in the morning, we come and then we account for all our birds in our collection, mm -hmm. which in breeding, we have, in breeding and research centre, we, we have about 400 plus birds. And then we start uh, clearing their food so we leave food overnight for them and then we clear in the morning make sure there's no um, food remnants on the floor make sure that area is clean and then mm. after that we head on to food prep prepping right. the breakfast for them chopping a lot of fruits which is why most keepers I believe don't like papaya pears or apples anymore <laughs> because we see too much of them yeah and then we feed them so this is um also a time for us to observe our birds because a lot of birds, because they are prey animals, they hide their sickness or their illness very well. Yeah. So we have to make sure that we observe our birds well and to know our birds well enough to spot anything that is off mm. so that we can get them the treatment they need in time. Mm. Yeah. So most of the time, that's what we do in the morning followed by a lot of dishes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no dishwasher? No dishwasher, <laughs> yeah. Dishwasher is you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, man. No man dishwasher. dishwasher. For right. So, um, I had a curious question as you were talking about, uh, you know, how you, how you look through the books and then you determine which, um, bird is compatible with mm. with which other bird, right? What happens? I mean, that's that's on paper. Mm. That's the best case scenario. What happens when it doesn't work out, mm. right? Maybe the one bird doesn't like the look of the other. One bird doesn't like the, the other song. So, you know, uh, what happens then? I guess if they if they are really incompatible, mm. we will try to look for alternative because there will always be the next best alternative. Right. Or like if the individual unfortunately don't make it, so we will pair them up again with the next best options. But a lot of times we try our best to pair up the individuals that need to. So over time, sometimes they will just gradually accept each other when they realise they have no other choice. Mm. Yeah, so we try our best. And then if it really, really doesn't um, match up because we really can't force them if they don't, yeah. then we will look for the next best alternative. Right. Yeah. So sometimes it's just a case of 
house them together long enough yes. and then yes. <laughs> grow to love each it's other. It's like, right? um, sure, I think how I met your mother, the dugong, <laughs> the dugong <laughs> effect or the mermaid effect, yes. Okay. That's what we hoped for, the, um, for our birds. Okay. Yeah. Mm, now it's a straw-headed boo-boo effect yes. as well. Um, so I think we have a video uh, prepared of um, uh, what it's like to be Rachel uh, in her day-to-day -day work. Um, so maybe we can we can play that and then we can uh, have a, a better idea of what it looks and sounds like where Rachel works. Okay, so now we are in the kitchen which is our food preparation area. So I'm going to start prepping for the soft fuse salad. Soft fuse are birds that eat soft diet like fruits. So they include passerines like the booboos, uh, pigeons and also hornbills. Uh, so this soft view salad is for the smaller birds, that's why we are cu cutting them smaller in size as compared to the home view which is uh, over here. Okay, so we are done with the papayas. And then we will mix in um, the apple, pears and banana that our kitchen has already prepped for us. And we will add um, their pellets. And then we mix them all up together. Okay, so here's the soft fish salad. Now let's go feed the birds. So now we're preparing the food for the straw-headed booboos. We'll give them soft fish salad, two worms for each of them, and then some egg food for protein, and pellets for insect birds. Okay, now that they're done feeding the booboos, let's go prepare a nest box for another pair of booboos. Okay, we're now inside the aviary, so I'm going to assemble a nest basket for the straw-headed booboo. I have the plastic basket for the structure, and then I'm putting in some coconut fibre uh, as nest lining so that it softens the impact of the hard structure. So that when they do lay eggs, the egg is not against the hard structure and it wouldn't risk breaking. So we'll put in the coconut fibre, and then we'll press it down with my teeth to create a cup shape. Okay, so now we're going to put it on the tree. So usually we're putting on the fork. In a while, the birds will naturally build their nest. Make sure there's a few points to secure the nest to. Okay, so now that the basket is secure, um, I'll put some other ferns around so that the birds will pick up to let us know whether they're interested in breeding or not. So these are just some ferns that I plucked off the perches earlier on. We just hang it around the aviary and the birds will use these to build the nest if they're interested to use. In the wild, the straw-headed booboos actually use dragon scale fern because of the way the roots are very clingy. They are kind of like Velcro. They will use it to make the external structure of the nest. Okay, now we'll wait and see if they are interested in nesting or not. Cool. That was so nice to have a behind-the-scenes view of what you do on a normal, you know, job. Um, the rest of us work in an office and you <laughs> get to work with birds. Doesn't seem fair. Wash dishes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think we found it really interesting that you make the nest for your birds. Um, what other, what other um, interesting preparation or tasks do you have to do to encourage, you know, a more conducive environment for breeding? Okay, a lot of time we also give them um, a range of nesting materials. Mm. As you've seen in the video, I was giving them some ferns. Mm. So the ferns are actually quite cool because they have a very sticky, not sticky in the sense of like, they, they're like Velcro. Right. So they hold a structure very well. In the wild, the straw-headed booboos actually use the ferns a lot to build their nests as well. Mm. But in, um, in our care, we don't have those plants growing in our aries. So we actually pluck, oh, I mean, I collect them around the park and then I give it to my birds. <laughs> yeah, so we leave it around the aries, hanging in our branches for them, right. trying to mimic what they have in the wild so that they will pick it up and um, and try to build a nest. Mm. So other than giving them baskets or like um, some, depending on what birds, sometimes they get a nest box, we also um, try to increase the supplements or we give them supplements during the breeding season yeah. and increase their protein intakes, like giving them more worms and insects, trying to trigger them into breeding. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, you know, I, I think you mentioned that we are uh, one of the only or the only yes, zoological the only. institution with straw-headed booboos. Mm. What kind of yeah, <laughs> interesting, you know, or, or never seen before 
um, happenings um, have you noticed with your breeding pairs uh, that you might that you know other zoological institutions in the future if they wanted to breed the straw headed bubu what might you share uh, okay so um Straw-headed bubbles are pretty sensitive species. So when they are breeding, we usually don't disturb their nest too much. But fortunately for us, um, we have a lot of CCTVs to help us monitor all these nests um, mm. and breeding activities. Mm. So some interesting things that I um, observed previously was, it happens from um, other pressurized species as well. But for straw-headed bubbles, I've seen them uh, pick up the, the poop of the chicks mm -hmm. and actually eating it. Oh. Yeah, and they actually the parents are will actually fight for it. So they will feed the chicks and then once the chick has eaten, they will almost immediately poop. Okay. Yeah, so the parents will stay there and walk, and wait for the poop to come. So they won't after feeding, they won't fly away, they will wait. And then sometimes the other one will come and they will wait until the chick poop and then they will eat it eat it. Yeah, which is quite cool because like birds have this natural diaper to help keep their nest clean. Right. Yeah, so these are um, some interesting things that I realized. Yeah. And, and why, do you know why, do we know why the parents fight over eating the diaper? I believe, <laughs> I believe the poop are quite nutritious too because okay. they are yeah. feeding the chick nutritious stuff. So Makes whatever sense. passed out. Yeah. yeah. And it also help keeps the nest clean. Yeah. So yeah, that's why they are eating it, I guess. IG is important. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, okay. Anyone fight over diapers? No, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although I was gonna say that it sounds like when we when I feed my kids, right, and usually after you know the child eats and then it's diaper time, so we always <laughs> kind of <laughs> camp out for <laughs> fight to not clean the diaper, and this one is the opposite, which is yeah. interesting. Um, so I think we you've you've given us some of the CCTV footage uh, yes. of um your nesting breeding attempts. Yes. Yeah. So perhaps we can draw that up and you can tell us what's going on. Yeah, okay. So this video uh, actually shows the first egg hatching. So the if the little movements that you are seeing now is actually the chick wriggling out from the egg. Mm. But what's interesting is after the chick fully comes out, the parents will do something. And this is the chick just hatched. Hatching, so hatching. the it's, yeah, it's hatching now. Coming out, yeah. So the yeah, um, the parent actually took up the eggshell and they threw it away. So a lot of times the bird will carry the eggshell to a place further away from their nest and throw it so that it will throw predators off guard. As right. it, it will throw the predator off so they don't know where the nest is because chicks are actually very good food, and they are easy prey because they are just there in the nest and really helpless. They so can't by fly. Yeah, they can't fly. <laughs> so by throwing the egg away, yeah. the egg shell further away, that the, they are trying to lead or mislead the predators somewhere else. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, and I think it, we had a second one. Let's see. So this is the video showing, I think it should be the first or second feeding of the this hatchling. Yeah. And, and what would the parent feed the, the chick here? So uh, for passerines or like straw-headed bubbles, they don't actually regurgitate, so they feed um, live worms. So they, ah. they feed insects most of the time at this young age, high-protein stuff. Okay. And then when they are slightly older, they will go to uh, fruits. As um, Dr. Jess mentioned, they are actually fruit-eating as well. Right, right. Mm. Nice. Thanks for sharing all this. So... Um, it was really great to hear, you know, so much about what you, you do um, in your work and how um, all, all your, uh, your, your work and, you know, how you work with even partners overseas, right, to uh, protect this very special species, straw-headed bubu. Um, but I guess, you know, what about the rest of us, right, who are at home or, you know, in Singapore, um, how can we... Uh, be also champions of straw-headed bubble conservation? How can we protect conservation together with you and your team? That's a great question and I'll start, I'll start it off. And you, can, you guys can see this slide here as well. Um, I think 
at the first go, if you do see strutted bobbles, right, uh, if it's injured or the bird seems sick or a young bird has fallen out of the nest and you're concerned, you mm. can actually notify the National Parks Board or ACRES, uh, the Wildlife Rescue Centre in Singapore, at, at those two numbers there, and they'll come and assist. Um, but most of the time, we recommend that you actually leave the bird alone um, because quite often, right, um, for example, when a young bird's leaving its nest, it may fall to the ground and not you know not make its first flight but that's part of the natural process of learning um, what you can also do um, is plant um, bobo friendly plants and and that could be plants that provide the bobo with nectar because the bird is not to eat nectar or fruits also uh, species that the bobos will use right as an as a nesting tree and finally you know Vera already mentioned this and I, I I can't agree anymore a lot of my friends who come to Southeast Asia uh, to do Bird watching, you know, what the bobo, the shorter bobo is one of their target species. And it's said that everywhere else in the range, in Kalimantan and all that, you don't really hear the bird, but you do here in Singapore. Mm. So we're all very fortunate to have the bobo here in Singapore amongst us. So if you're out and about, you know, walking in nature reserve, listen out for the bobo and appreciate them, right, in, in the wild. Yeah, but I guess it's a bit difficult to learn birding. Um, you know, overnight. like at, overnight. So if you want a gentle start, you can come to our park, <laughs> visit our park to hear the boobos that we have, and try to listen out to what they sound like before you move to the nature places in the Good wild boy. to listen to, the, to listen to that. Yeah. So where in uh, bird paradise can we see? Oh, we the have them in the Song of the Forest. Song of the Forest. Yeah. Okay. So I think in bird paradise, the concept is more. Um, of an aviary concept, you walk into uh, the habitat of the uh, birds. So you do have to walk through, use your eyes, use your ears, um, look out for the yellow cap. <laughs> of the, oh, where, where, where is our You'll most mascot? likely hear them. <laughs> most likely hear them before you see them, actually. Yeah. So listen out for the call um, and, you know, appreciate them for... Um, the, the wonderful birds that they are. Um, so, I think with that, thank you so much, um, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Um, we've received a couple of questions, actually a bunch of questions, uh, which we will be answering in a little while. So, we'll um, proceed to a time of Q&A. So, Rachel, I think the first question is for you. Um, what types of enrichment are provided to our straw-headed bobos in Mandai? So, there's a few enrichment that we do give them. So, one is food enrichment. Mm. We give them live insects like what they will get in the wild, like crickets and mealworms. We scatter them on the floor for them to forage, as well as fruits. So, we will cut big chunks of fruits. Unlike the one shown in the video, we will cut big chunks and then we will spike it on the tree for them. For, oh. Just for foraging activity Breeding is also an enrichment So we give them like the ferns to hang around And coconut fibre So they can make their own nest themselves Yeah, so these are some of the enrichment That we give the straw-headed booboos Oh, nice Sounds like, uh, sounds like fun <laughs> um, Oh, excuse me, I forgot to Okay, so next question here Is, uh, are straw-headed booboos monogamous? Uh, so when... The pair is still around. They actually do stay together for quite a time, some time. Mm. But if unfortunately one of we lose one of them, then the pair, the remaining one, might look for a separate partner. Okay. Yeah. So it's really they will stay loyal to each other while they are still around. Death, death yes. do us part. Oh yes, death, death do us part. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice to know. Um, okay, next one and related. How many chicks have hatched in Mandai? So far, we have an, around nine chicks. Okay. So far, yes, I think around nine there. chicks. Oh, mm. Well done. And um, you know, you do so much for the birds, right? Do they form strong bonds with you? So we try not to form any bond with them, right? And um, so they are also quite flighty birds, as you see. So they don't really form a bond with us. Okay. Yeah, but then we feed them every day. So maybe we are. Bonded to them, but they are not bonded to us. Yeah, so it's a kind yes. of one-sided yeah, relationship. One -sided ah. re oh, yes. no. <laughs> well, it's all for the greater good, I guess. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and I think you mentioned uh, you don't you try not to get too involved with the birds and get them too used to your 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 presence, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, this question, this next question, is quite kind of related. So, does Mandai have plans to reintroduce the birds back to the wild? Um, 
And uh, a, another related question was, can a hen reared chick be reintroduced to the wild? And uh, if they can, what age can the chick be released or reintroduced? Okay, so we haven't had the opportunity to release any of our Henriot chicks or any of our chicks, in fact, back into the wild. Hopefully, mm. in the long-term plan, there will be. Mm. And then, uh, at what age? Usually, we will release full-grown adults to make sure that they have the skills to be able to learn to forage and to survive and to fence off any predator that they need. Yeah. Yeah, and also to look for a partner, so they need to know how to sing in the case of straw-headed woo-woo to make sure that they can survive in the wild. Because if... Or especially if the threats is, are not removed from the wild, there's no point in us releasing more um, birds into the wild where the threats are still there. Yeah, yep. uh, that's that's very true. And I suppose back to your point about enrichment, you know, giving them live um, mm. insects and mm. giving them big chunks of food spiked on the tree, yeah. that's all kind of prep for... Yeah, so yeah. they can identify. So a lot of times, like our birds get fed papaya in cubes, right? Mm. But in the wild, there's no one cubing it for them. So they won't be able to recognize papaya on the tree if yes. they really need to eat. Or yeah. like crickets if it's frozen. Yes. They won't know what a live one looks like or the, ver- the different species they are. Yeah. So by offering this, we try to create the environment to help them be able to survive in the wild as well. Yeah. Mm. So um, next one, still you. <laughs> <You're popular. laughs> yes, uh, straw-headed bobos territorial. Do they defend the territory, um, and do they need a large area to be to sustain themselves? Okay, so um, for the ones in our collection or the one under human care, we do mm. he- we do see them being a bit territorial. So mm. as a precaution, here we try to house them far apart, especially because they are songbirds. Yeah. they sing quite loudly, and songbirds get territorial over calls like their songs. So we try to house them further apart so that they don't hear each other. Mm. Whereas in the wild, I think there's still a lot to be discovered on to study about this population, uh, this species. Yep. So we are not so sure what is the spatial range that they need for each pair or each family group. Uh, but in general, I would think they will need a large population to themselves, a large area to mm. themselves. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And um, I think our next question is uh, moving on to Jess. Right? I think Rachel, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Rachel. <laughs> you, might, you might come back on in, in a little <laughs> bit. Um, so Jess, is the population on Pulau Ubin uh, close to a population peak? So Pulau Ubin, uh, for our overseas um, listeners, it's uh, an island that's near to the mainland uh, of Singapore. Um, and it's also one of the places where straw-headed bubus are found. Um, And uh, the next question that's related as well is, is the population in Singapore displaying any signs of inbreeding depression? Um, And if so, how might we uh, alleviate this issue? Okay, those are really great questions. Um, Mm -hmm. So for those overseas, um, Pula Ubin is not a very large island. It's actually one of our small offshore islands. And it's very indicated, and also in the slides earlier on, there are lots of bubbles in Pulau Ubin. I think the reality is we haven't really studied the population enough to understand whether or not carrying capacity is reached on the island yet. Neither have we done that for Singapore. So we've done a few surveys over the last, you know, say five, se- five to ten years. But all those were, you know, basic uh, population assessments. Not n- in no way are those deep enough, right, to really determine carrying capacity, whether there's enough habitat left or food um, left on the island for all these birds and how many birds can they actually whole. So all that require further study that, that is currently ongoing and there are plans to do more of these more in-depth studies. Um, now in terms of inbreeding and um, depression in Singapore, we also haven't done the genetic analysis yet. There's actually genetic work currently ongoing to see if we can figure that out. Um, but it, it brings up a really good point because for any um, population of birds that's limited to an island or to a small area, inbreeding can become a big problem. But also aging population, right? You yeah. may be working in a group of birds that's getting older and older over the years. Yeah. So the only way to circumvent that really um, is to get new blood in, and that could be through wild population exchanges with other countries that still have the bobo. Mm. Uh, but that comes with its own suite of complications because mm. you need to get all the right stakeholders involved in those in those meetings and discussions mm. to make the best call for those species. Mm. So really, this is something in our future, you know, in the long-term plans, yeah. but something that we'll need a lot of working on and getting buy-in from everyone. Yeah. Never an easy time. 
Um, okay, so um, somebody wanted to know what are the main conditions that classify this species as critically endangered. Um, so uh, Jess mentioned. I mentioned a whole bunch of things. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, if you remember from the slide earlier, in I think it was 2016, where the bird was actually re uh, reassessed, right, to uh, an endangered status, and then shortly between 2016 and 2018, it was reassessed again to uh, as critically endangered. And what prompted that uh, CR uplisting, unfortunately, is uh, a population decline. So essentially people who are working with the species in the field, and, and this is not just in, in Singapore, but across the range. So we saw the map earlier, the grey, this, this includes countries like uh, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, and all that, right? It, people working on the species across the range started noticing that it's harder to see the birds mm -hmm. or hear the birds. Um, and that sort of indicates that you know, maybe not as common as they were before in a while. So yeah. it suggests a decline. And a few studies have sh sort of shown it. And so that warranted, uh, you know, us saying, okay, we need to relook at this bird and reassess it because we're not seeing the numbers anymore. Its area of occupancy has been reduced as well. So they're not seen in places they were originally seen before. Mm -hmm. So those two things prompted that uplisting to CR. Right. And is this, uh, another question came in that was, how often do we, you know, assess this? That's a really good question. So the, the red list um, for birds, which is overseen by BirdLife International, the red list authority, um, happens actually quite frequently. I think it's, you know, every year you can submit inputs mm. or every few years. Uh, but in the case of the Strider Bobo, it was something that people started noticing. Like, I don't hear, I don't see the birds. Maybe yeah. there's something going on. Yeah. And that led to a lot of uh, work on the ground to figure out what was actually happening. And so what was originally a sensing, so to speak, right, became more dedicated, few work. Yeah. Um, and then that led to saying, okay, actually, right, the sensing was right. We're not, the birds are actually gone from most of its range. Let's reassess it. Where yeah. is it seen before? Where is it, wh where is it disappeared? And then figure out what the decline was. Um, so, yeah, but, right. but uh, assessments ha happen only when they have to happen. Yeah. But anyone can submit an assessment if they feel there's a strong need Mm -hmm. So, for example, we start seeing, I, I don't know, hundreds of bubbles in the trade out of the blue, right? That will prompt, you know, a response. Yeah. yeah. So, it's really on the owners. Um, the, the onus is really on the researchers or maybe People the who are familiar who are uh, or working with the species. Yeah, to kind of yeah. raise the flag and say... Yeah, so there's those instances where a flag is raised and then yeah. there's those instances where it's your, you know, your routine yeah. assessment period and yeah. that's where you, you reassess a bit. I yep. see. Okay. So practically, how is um, you know population? How are population numbers tracked? Uh, what are the kind of tasks that go into this? There are many <laughs> ways to. That's a that's a really a very big, a very loaded question because there's many ways to assess yeah. uh, a population. Um, in the case of Australia bobo, I'll just you know use the example we did here on Monday. We had a master student go out to look for the bobos, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it requires a lot a, a dedicated person, firstly, who's willing to spend his morning, afternoons, and evenings following bobos around, right? So it's so someone goes in the field at, sp at specific times or all day, and essentially detects the presence or absence of a bobo. And then if you want to do more, more insight um, studies into the bird, every time you see a bird, you can then follow the bird to see what it's doing. Is it eating? What's it eating on? You know, eating, if it's breeding, where is it breeding? What's it using as a, a nest? And all that will give you the information you need, right? Mm -hmm. But the presence absence, which is, you know, the, what we call population assessment, where someone goes on a field and just goes and detect bobo or no bobo, um, quite, quite often, absence or presence gives you a sense of whether or not the bird is there. Yeah. Now, in the case of Strider bobo, because they're getting rarer, they're getting harder to see, but harder to hear. Mm -hmm. And for a bird that you can hear before you see them, right? So, bobo is a bird you hear first before you see it. If you don't hear them, that's already sort of an indicator of like, oh, maybe the population isn't doing too good. Mm -hmm. You can forget about seeing the bird if you're not hearing it. But fundamentally, um, field surveys happen in, in various ways, um, transects, right, um, hectare, you know, per hectare searches. So it, it really boils on the question you're asking and what you want out of the information you yeah. designed the field surveys. And then to answer, the, to sort of round it all up, to monitor population over time, you need to invest time. Yeah. So it's not just doing it, you know, this week and not doing it again. You start doing sort of like routine surveys mm -hmm. 
every month or every year mm -hmm. so that you track the population that you are familiar with right yeah. over a period of time so you can actually tell if they're trends or not so, yeah. so that's how we generally track it yeah. um, but like I said it depends on the questions you're asking yeah. your methodology will yeah will, will differ right thanks Jess sharing all that um, so you know I think both of you have um, had your own encounters with straw-headed bubbles, um, maybe in the field, maybe um, in Mandai, you know, uh, where in, in the place where you work. Um, what is the most memorable encounter you had with this species? Um, I'm going to start because I'm very scared Rachel oh, steals my story. <laughs> 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 so my most memorable encounter was uh, when one of our staff, um, you know, uh, told us that she found a young bobo that had fallen off his nest uh, quite late in the day and so they picked it up because they're, they're getting worried the weather wasn't looking great so it was and it was the heavy thunderstorms at night mm. plus there was a cat that hangs around the area so everyone's a bit worried of the safety of the bobo but please guys who are those who are listening in a normal situation don't touch a wild bird it's just that we have every reason to believe here through expert opinion the bird had to be taken under human care for a while so we did um, and then we housed it overnight at the Bird Paradise uh, Wards uh, mm -hmm. for babies. And the next day we, we released it back to a while and uh, reconnected the, the, the young bird with its parents. It's memorable for me because I've never been close to a shrouded bobo as in, you know, that close. So right. that was the first time I was within 30 centimeters oh. of a bird. I can't, Can I? I can't speak, I can't say the same as, you know, <laughs> as Rachel. My story is different. But yes, that was memorable. Oh, hmm. how about Rachel? Yeah, I guess it's the same as Jess, because <laughs> we worked on it together. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, but it was, the, although I get to see the chicks of them, but it's still um, under our care. But yeah. this one was a wild one that we got to rehabilitate back with the parents. So mm. it was quite interesting because the moment we brought the chick back, we could hear the parents come and the parents actually came down to the chick. So it was oh. quite a memorable day for us to reunite the, the chick back with the parents. Nice. Yeah. And it was nice because it's a wild one. Yeah, yeah. it was a wild one. Cool. Um, I think carrying on with you, Rachel, uh, this question is probably best answered by you. Which aviaries in bird paradise can we find straw-headed bubbles and why were these aviaries chosen to hold them? Well, the straw-headed bubbles are in Song of the Forest mm -hmm. and there's also one in Lorry Loft. So Song of the Forest because I guess they're housed there because they're called Song of the Forest and the and most of the songbirds are there. <laughs> yeah, so if you go to Song of the Forest, you can actually hear a lot of songs. They're very original. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it tells you what you need to yeah, find out from the yeah. Avery Song of the Forest, so you can hear a lot of songs. Yes, even in the transition building, you can hear there's a display where you can you can click on to hear the Surah Bubu songs. Mm. Yeah, so you can visit the Avery to see how the Surah Bubu looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So normally, do they kind of hang out together um, as a flock or are they kind of individual? Do they stay individually? So we initially put a pair in mm. and then I think they have some chicks now. Yeah. And they do come down during keeper's talk, if I'm not wrong, yeah, um, for the food. But okay. they are not bonded to us. They just, yeah. they just know it's time for food. They so just, they will they be there. there. Food. <laughs> yeah. and you can, or you can ask the keepers. So best time, to guys, to see a straw <laughs> the bobo is to come for a keeper's talk. Yeah, during the keeper's talk, you can ask the keepers where they are. Yeah. They might be able to find out. Yes. Mm. Okay, nice. Um, there is a question that came in, but it's not on a slide. Um, what is the straw headed bobo's predator? Or do they have, what, what predators do we know of? <laughs> so I guess in the wild in Singapore, um, predators could be snakes, mm -hmm. you know, your pythons, um, but also large reptiles like uh, monitors. Yeah. And I think that the the birds at risk to being predated on would be the chicks and the eggs. Yeah. Um, so anything that can fit a bobo egg in its mouth or a chick, or even hornbills, right, oriental pie hornbills, mm -hmm. if they find a nest, macaques, mm -hmm. so anything that would you know, opportunity to eat meat, right, would also predate on a uh, straw bobo. Yeah. Um, yeah. But and maybe large raptors if they do catch a, a large bird. Mm. So lots of predators actually in, 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 mm. <laughs> in the wild. Yeah. And which is why we saw in that CCTV uh, video the mum uh, oh, the, the mother bird yeah, so yes. you know, pick up the eggshell and, and deposit it somewhere else and it's just to disguise the location of the nest, right? Um, okay, really cool. Um I think we're down to our last questions here. 
Um, and, and these questions were all kind of lumped together because they're all about, you know, how can we take action? I think there's lots of uh, interest around um, what the public can do, uh, what youth can do. Um, this is one of the questions. Uh, what can they do for straw-headed bubbles? So um, I'm just going to read off the questions. Um, what can we do to help straw-headed bubbles and their habitats? That's one. Um, somebody has a very practical idea. Can I prepare a bird nest or water bath in my balcony so that presumably the birds can come and um, use them? Um, and third one, how can youths play a bigger part in conservation efforts? So uh, maybe Jess, you can start. Okay, so for the first question is um, uh, the planting, right? Was it planting? Um, how, yeah, what can we do to help straw-headed bubbles and their habitat? Yep, so uh, if, you, if you recall one of the slides, we sort of said that you could, if you live in landed property, mm. or if you work in a place or go to school somewhere where there's opportunities for you to, you know, help you know, plant a small garden or something along those lines, um, then you can always encourage straw-headed bubble you know, habitat and therefore and the birds, right, being there by planting for them. So it could be planting their their main food food feeding trees, um, planting the trees they, they nest in. Mm -hmm. All that would be really helpful because what you're doing is helping to extend their natural landscape. And you're encouraging them to, you know, to stay in a space that is obviously safe because, you know, if if you're there to watch the bird then the bird's in very good hands. Uh, I think I'll take the last question, which yeah. is... Um, how can youths play a bigger part in conservation efforts? So you can always uh, join Mandai as a volunteer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, shameless plug. Yes. But you can join Mandai as a volunteer because um, every year we do run bird surveys at Mandai and we do have opportunities to work, if not with the short-headed bobo directly, with other species of birds. Um, but it's, it's available through a lot of volunteer programs where we do have like surveys for, for birds or reptiles at night, etc. So you can sign on, but you know, sign on as a volunteer first before... Yeah before you can jump on one of these surveys. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also just spreading you know, the word, right? Raising the awareness of the plight of the birds in your communities, in, in, the, in the schools you go to, whatever social groups you, you're a part of, right? Yeah. Is spreading the word, discouraging the keeping of striped bubbles as pets and the trade of the birds, but you know, playing a role in actively raising awareness. And I, I think there's value there, especially for Singaporean youth, because this bubble you know, it, Singapore is like one of the f last few strongholds for the species and therefore th it should be precious to us as, mm -hmm. uh, as part of our natural heritage mm -hmm. that we hope to continue having, right, uh, for future gener generations. Yeah, I think it's really something to be proud of um, that we're considered like, as a stronghold for yep. the straw-headed bubu as well. Um, and I think that leaves the very last question for Rachel. Can I prepare a bird nest or water bath in my balcony <coughs> for straw-headed bubbles? I guess um, you can plant, like what Dr. Jess said, plant the, material, the plants that are friendly for them. Mm -hmm. So like dragon scale ferns, mm -hmm. these are what they use to make the nest. Whereas for planting a nest, even in the birds that are in our care, they don't use the nest that we put. So they are quite independent, they would like to build it themselves. Yeah. So I would think putting the materials would be, uh, they mm -hmm. would use the material more than using the nest that is already there. Yeah. Yeah. And for straw-headed bubbles, probably you, you, you mentioned a few times, they're quite flighty. They're mm. probably not going to stay yes. on your balcony yeah. and make, it, make their home, uh, make their nest. Yeah, you probably wouldn't nest somewhere where the humans will be frequently moving around yeah. like a balcony. Yeah, yeah. right. Cool. Okay. Um, so I think that wraps up our um, webinar for today. Thank you so much for listening. Um, so just a few last... Um, comments on what, what you can do. I think uh, Jess and Rachel both have mentioned, you know, if you do see uh, injured uh, straw-headed bobos or any other wildlife, do contact and parks or acres at these numbers. Um, and I think uh, Lorraine has dropped um, a link to our volunteer um, page as well. Uh, so if you did want to volunteer with us, um, these are programs where you can uh, first advocate for um, uh, animals uh, or conservation efforts or sustainability efforts uh, with our park guests, um, or you could volunteer with animal care, uh, animal, care animal care teams or research teams as well. So uh, do check out that link. And uh, last thing is uh, we do really want to continue with our webinars, Conservation Champions webinars, and we're always looking to see how we can improve. So um, do scan this QR code 
if you can um, and give us your honest feedback. Uh, we're always very happy to hear from you. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Uh, have a great evening. Thank you.